Uh, welcome, um, and thank you for coming to the Semmel Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a, a great talk today by Dr. Joel Braslau. He is a native Southern Californian, born and raised in Riverside, who came to UCLA as a pathology intern, believe it or not, in 1984. He tells me that he liked pathology at UCLA, but his clinical passion rapidly became psychiatry, and by the next year he had switched to psychiatry. Um, autopsies are not great preparation for taking care of live parent patients, he says. So he did another internship at the Sepulveda Veterans Administration. Because of an interest in psychoanalysis, he then did his psychiatry residency at Cedar sinai one of the few psychoanalytically oriented residency that um, had survived at that point the onslaught of biologically oriented residency programs. Curious about why psychiatrists do what they do in treating patients, he decided to pursue a PhD at UCLA in the history of medicine as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical style and completed his PhD uh, in 1994. He then joined the UCLA faculty in both the Department of Psychiatry and the Department of History. He remained a faculty member at UCLA until just two months ago when he took a position at Columbia University as professor of psychiatry. His distinguished applied clinical and scholarly social science uh, research career has been dedicated to the study of the phenomenon of psychosis and, and, and of care for people with psychosis spectrum disorders. He founded the Social Sciences Track within the NIH-funded Medical Student Training Program, MSTP, at UCLA, and spawned the discipline of social medicine in the psychiatry department, which he defines as bringing the theories of, of um, of medicine and our understanding uh, of bringing sorry the the methods and theories of the social sciences and humanities to bear on improving the practice of medicine and our understanding of of science. He also co-founded the Center for Social Medicine and Humanities with me as chair of the search committee. He was the chair of the search committee that hired me, and that was part of the negotiations. He has a unique big historical picture of the discipline of psychiatry and its age-old relationship to psychosis, and has developed insightful analyses of the tragic failures of contemporary mental health and social services to care for people with psychosis. He has been especially interested in understanding the social, economic, and clinical forces that have led to unprecedented proportions of people with psychosis spinning through chronic cycles of homelessness and punitively criminalized carceral settings following deinstitutionalization since the 1960s and continuing in the present. His work has been funded by the NIMH, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. He directed the MSTP Social Science Track at UCLA since its inception in 2012, up until two months ago. Consequently, we are especially thrilled, Joel, to have you um, here today and committed to remaining an active member of our intellectual community. And we look forward to reading uh, your magnum opus on the history of schizophrenia, which um, you are, I'm told by you and others, in the final sprint to complete under contract with Johns Hopkins University Press entitled A Clinical Biography of Schizophrenia. So the floor is yours, Joel. Thanks so much, Philippe, for that. Um... Um, introduction and um, yeah, I'm yeah I'm uh, optimistic that I'm on this fi final sprint. Um, let me um, I you know I realized it's kind of bittersweet um, this talk on especially brought home especially when I was looking for you know I know my last template of a, you know was UCLA and so I had it just really brought home the fact that I'm no longer at UCLA. Um, as of, I guess, September 1st. So anyway, and I, it's, I thought of it doing a um, slide of what I miss about um, LA and what I don't miss about LA. And then um, my wife told me I couldn't tell any jokes. So I mean, not that I'm very good at it anyway. Um, but, and so I, that slide I cut, um, but I, um, I guess I'd be honest, I don't miss my car very much, um, but I, 
Um, you know, and then I had to actually have a hard time thinking of what else I do miss, you know, um, what I don't miss, because I, I actually miss very much my colleagues, especially Philippe and um, Enrico, although I see him on Zoom all the time, and um, Ippy and Helena Hansen, and I really miss the MSTP students, and um, hopefully we'll stay in touch with them as they progress. But um, so anyway, I'm, I'm very excited to present and um, this talk and um, to be able to at least um, give you a flavor of what I'm working on. Um, so the talk is on homelessness um, and incarceration and serious mental illness. Um, I taking a historical perspective. And I realized as I was rethinking the talk that it's easy for me to get lost in the woods as opposed to seeing the forest. And so I thought, I, you know, especially trying to cover 300 years, which is um, a lot um, for a, a relatively short talk. So I thought, oh, I should really give the Reader's Digest version of what I want to get across. Um, and um, as obviously we all know, we're facing an unprecedented psychiatric and humanitarian crisis with unprecedented numbers of individuals um, with serious mental illness who are both homeless and being incarcerated or living in you know, lives that are of you know, isolation and desperation. Um, and so what I wanted to do in this talk, at least the overall take home, is to show how homelessness and incarceration of the mentally ill is not a new problem. And that um, in fact, homelessness and the jailing of the mentally ill had become a major humanitarian crisis at the end of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and that this was the result of major social and um, cultural ruptures in traditional family and community life. Um, which led to a complete breakdown of traditional society, social forms of caring for those with serious mental illness. And the, so it's in, and the creation of the asylum um, is completely and um, linked to these sort of larger social changes in um, caring for those with serious mental illness. And the creation of the asylum that I hope to show us how that that was intimately related to trying to solve the problem of homelessness and incarceration at the um, beginning of the 19th to mid 19th centuries. Um, and I think one can argue, and I try to show it in the talk, that asylums and state hospitals largely succeeded in caring for those who otherwise would have been homeless in jail. Um, and then with the dismantling of these institutions in the 1960s, um, you see a reemergence of the same problems that led precisely to the creation in the first place. Um, the talk isn't an argument necessarily for the return to state hospitals, but it's an argument that we can learn something from the past. And in this case, I think um, we can learn something about the nature of state hospital policy and primarily what I you know, hope to get across is that it was predicated on several um, assumptions that mental health policy seems to have um, um, lost touch with over the last 50 years. Um, and these kind of simple principles are, are that mental health illness was often chronic requiring a lifelong commitment to care that mental illness involved in individuals' social, psychological, and biological lives. And as such, care and treatment needed to reflect and needed to address all aspects of a patient's life. Since the institutionalization, mental health policy has often ignored these fundamental principles and I believe unwittingly has reinforced the very problems often that it has tried to solve. So with that, hopefully, um, that hope, it, introduction. Um, I have this in kind of three or four epics rather, but I'm going to just touch upon, I mean, I, the first two, to be quite honest, I'm going to, um, because I'm in the interest of time, but I, I do want to say um, that there was a moment in time that mental illness as an, as a disease um, didn't exist. Um, and in prior to the 17th century, um, that our um, modern conception 
of you know, mental illness um, was quite different than how we conceive of it today. I mean, there are many explanations for why an individual went mad and locating it in the body and locating it as a disease as we think of today is quite um, um, different than it was thought of in you know, the pre 18th century. Um, and you can see, I mean, there are lots of explanations for why someone went mad, whether it was relig religious ecstasy, demonic possession, you know, it could be uh, disordered um, humoral imbalances or somewhere in the body. But there are numerous explanations for madness. And um, this is just a painting showing um, from the 15th century that is um, showing um, a, someone possessed by um, a demon and the demon, as you can see, is fleeing the individual who is possessed. Um, and this is just a slide of showing um, potential imbalances, um, humoral imbalances, um, and depicting the four humors and how those could potentially lead to illness and potentially imbalances could lead to badness as well. Um, the second period, again, just want to touch on is you know, the birth of the asylum and the creation of psychiatric disease. In order to have psychiatric disease, you also need psychiatrists and you need specialized institutions to care for people with psychiatric disorders. So it's not kind of hard to tell cart before the horse, but um, it wasn't until the 18th and 19th centuries that um, madness became um, a disease of the body. And this um, became um, in the, from the essentially the 18th, to the mid um, 19th centuries, um, increasing effort to locate disorders of the mind in both the body and the brain and nervous system and mapping the brain and nervous system as well um, during this period of time. Um, but there, this transformation also rested upon major social, cultural, and economic changes. So I did briefly to touch on, there was in the um, Industrial Revolution wrought huge changes in um, both or social organization, family organization, um, you know, it was, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution um, transformed really dramatically the ways in which families cared for their loved ones. Um, and um, what, just to give you an example of what that looked like, I mean, um, one sort of measure of the ways in which the world changed so dramatically is just looking, here's a slide on um, looking at urbanization in the um, UK. And as you can see, it's pretty dramatic. There, um, with industrialization and you have an increasing shift of population from the um, countryside to the metropolis. Um, and as you can imagine, this would be quite disruptive on families and the ability of families to care for their loved ones who otherwise um, you know, weren't, who, um, who needed care. And um, the same phenomenon you can see um, in the United States. And this is just, again, showing um, urbanization in the US and it's comparing various regions across the country. Um, and again, it's similar, although happening a bit later, but you can see a similar trend. Um, and um, just to make a local comparison is that as of 2020, as of the 2020 census, California led the nation um, with 94% um, of the population um, being um, in um, urban centers. And not what the reason why I'm bringing this up, of course, is that the, uh, with urbanization, you have the breakdown of um, uh, family structures and the ability to care for your loved ones. And um, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, um, families um, were increasingly unable to care for their loved ones. This became increasingly acute at, towards the end of the 18th century. Um, and with this, there's a simultaneous and um, 
reformulation that madness is a medical illness of both body and mind. And I don't have time to go into the details, but what is really fascinating is the way in which institutions were very critical to the creation of psychiatry as a profession and the ability to recognize what counts as an illness or what counts as a disease and thinking about how to come up with various categories of insanity. Um, and But what was critical about the creation of institutions was also a belief that insanity was also curable and that most importantly, insanity was curable through um, what was um, called moral therapy. Um, moral therapy was developed simultaneously, both in um, France as well as in the UK. The most famous in psychiatrist of this era, or what would be called a psychiatrist, because prior to um, the development of asylums, there were there was no profession of psychiatry um, as such. But Philippe Pinal is considered the father of psychiatry, um, and he um, this is a famous picture of Pinal freeing um, the um, mad from their chains at the Salpetriere in. Um, during the French Revolution. And moral, the important part about moral therapy was that it provided the intellectual, organizational, and medical rationale for both um, Western Europe as well as in the um, Anglo-American world um, to create institutions that were both simultaneously therapeutic as well as providing care for people with serious mental illness. Um, just as an aside, and I'll touch on it as we go on, but is that the rationale behind moral therapy also remained within state hospitals, albeit in a different language, but largely um, the, the belief that the institution itself was therapeutic and that you could um, affect mental illness by changing the social world around an individual. Um, here are some, um, this is a, just a photograph of William Took, um, or a, a picture, of, not a photograph, and uh, the York Retreat, which he was famous for. It was a um, Quaker institution. Um, but what I wanted to do is here's a slide just on what moral therapy principles consist of. Um, recreating a family-like setting, moral therapy aimed to educate the mad and appeal to their rationality through a humane and caring environment. Tuch and Pinel renounced physical restraints and emphasized persuasion over overt coercion in affecting cure through meaningful activities, useful labor, and seclusion from the exciting causes of madness. Moral therapy provided the ideological support for the creation of what would become eventually a vast network of state-funded asylums. And so the so what I want to turn to is the creation of this um, of essentially a public mental health policy that occurred across the United States and also in um, Western Europe, and um, would be the kind of mainstay of mental health policy um, until the 1960s. Um, and um, let me make sure I'm there. So. Throughout um, the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, st state mental health budgets generally accounted for the lion's share of expenditures um, in states, certainly throughout the 19th and most of the, and, and the first half of the 20th century. I think you know, that, that was absolutely the case. Um, the massive spending across the United States created, created a really pretty amazingly large network of you know, asylums. And then in the 20th century, they were renamed state hospitals. Um, and um, in fact, some states had spend up to a third of their budget on mental health care. And just as the erosion of the family and traditional social forms of care had led to the asylum, the same forces helped sustain both the asylum and its continued growth. Um, and um, as um, in addition, it, it was throughout the 19th century, 
there would continue to be concern about individuals with serious mental illness being jailed as well as falling into homelessness or falling into being ending up in almshouses or in poor houses. Um, and um, this led increasingly throughout the mid 19th century onward um, for um, advocates to um, call for reforming how we care for individuals with serious mental illness and, for, and, and creating an adequate system of mental health care based on asylums. Um, and um, this is just a quote from um, um, Dorothea Dix, who's pro um, probably the most you know, well-known for um, helping create the um, public asylum uh, um, across the United States, actually. Um, and as you can see, she this is an 1843 um, plea to the Massachusetts legislature um, and what she described as outrages upon humanity and legalized barbarity, which um, you know, it's hard not to, when we're um, walking down the street in Westwood, especially, I mean, just to see that we could reproduce certain um, circumstances that were just as, as present also in the 19th century. She said, I proceed gentlemen to briefly call your attention to the present state of insane persons confined within this commonwealth in cages, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods and lashed into obedience. Um, and then she continued. I come as an advocate of helpless, forgotten, insane, and idiotic men and women of being sunk to a condition from which the most unconcerned would start with real horror. Mm -hmm. about that. Um, with real horror. Where am I now? Um, with real horror of being wretched in our prisons and more wretched in our almshouses. Regardless of the direct impact that Dix had um, on the creation of, a, of uh, the asylum and then state hospital network of care, um, uh, it it did. You know, I mean, six, I'm not surprised. I mean, as we what is well known, created a huge um, you know network of state hospitals to address the growing problem of homelessness and. Um, incarceration. And just to give you, um, this slide is showing the growth of state hospitals. So 1900, essentially states across the country renamed themselves, renamed their asylums and state hospitals. So uh, for the convenience sake, the state hospitals, you can see just pretty remarkable the growth um, throughout the you know, end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century up until, and this period right here is 1955, which um, is the um, peak uh, patient, uh, resident patient population. And that was 559,000. And it also coincides with the introduction of chlorpromazine. But as I'll talk about um, late, um, a bit later, is that I really don't think chlorpromazine, it was a, that which is an antipsychotic drug, which was first you know, introduced in 1954-55, um, is probably just a secondary um, kind of consequence in terms of leading to this period where you can see a rapid decline in patient population, uh, resident patient population, and a little offset by admissions um, on the rates of admission. But you can see the steady decline to, you know, to this is 2005 with the um, uh, patient population of about 40,000 or so. Um, what um, I want to contrast this, though, with is this figure here, and this it's really hard to have good data on this, but what it this is a showing the percentage of individuals with serious mental illness that are either in jails or in prisons. And um, as you can see, it, it roughly follows the um, inversely. Um, this the state hospital population. And I don't want to make it too, I mean, it, it's a little complicated. And I think one would be wrong to say there's a direct 
you know, simple one-to-one -one correspondence, but certainly there is a clear relationship. Um, and that deinstitutionalization beginning in the 1950s is a, the major engine, I think, for um, the current, I mean, at least in accounting for um, the current uh, you know, epidemic of people in jails and, um, and that are homeless that have serious mental illness. Um, but um, we'll talk, I'll talk a little more at the end of the talk at, um, on this um, kind of end of the curve. Um, but what I would like to do now, since this is a California centric, um, I mean, since, <laughs> although doing it from Zoom, I guess I am in New York, but um, I do want to, my research has been mostly in California anyway. And so I want to take a little, um, you know, shift um, for the most of the remainder of the talk and to look at California. Um, the, um, the three years, essentially three years after statehood, a little, um, and a little less than that, in 1953. I mean, 1853, California built its first asylum, which was named the California Asylum for the Insane at Stockton. The state then opened four more asylums over the course of the 19th century. Just as elsewhere, the major arguments for creating asylums in California was a growing population of individuals who are homeless or on the verge of homelessness, um, uh, often being incarcerated, and that the state had an obligation to do something about this. And um, this was seen as the construction most the construction of the asylum, you know, whether you know, if you look at any of the sort of um, legislature um, um, documents around um, the construction of each of the asylums. It is it, the major driving force is the social problems that are arising from not caring for people with serious mental illness. Um, then in the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, four new state hospitals were constructed. Um, and, and then a whole slew after um, the post-war. I won't talk about that right in a second. But um, just to give you an idea of what, you know, this is a um, early building of the Stockton's um, Asylum for the Insane. And um, in the, I know the quotation here, this sort of underscores what the purpose, of, what they, at least the rhetoric of, why um, the asylum was built. And this is from the first annual report, the intention in every such establishment being the restoration and comfort of the afflicted, the relief and um, the relief and their families and the protection of the community. It is economy, justice and humanity to provide at once all the appliances necessary. Um, you know, while, I mean, it's, Stockton may not have necessarily lived up to these aspirations. I mean, it does um, kind of underscore at least that um, um, Senate, the impetus behind um, the massive public funding of these institutions. Um, just this is another, just to show you that moral therapy remained um, a kind of critical mainstay of therapeutic rationale, is it rash, um, policy rationale and therapeutic rationale and um, what it, they, um, that, um, and here, I'll just read it really quickly. In, in the moral treatment of patients, their reception and classification, their exercise and employment, their diet, cleanliness and comfort are objects of the first importance and receive particular attention. The institution possesses an eligible and healthy situation, plain and substantial buildings, large, airy, and well-ventilated rooms, cold and warm shower baths, ample space for recreation, and grounds for labor with plenty of trees, shade, and pure air. Um, and the reason why it's worth emphasizing is just that for the 19th century, and it's also true for the 20th century, is how care and treatment are completely integrated into the context of where people are living. Um, just keep that in, in mind and to underscore that. Um, here's California's um, rise in patient population in the first half of uh, the 20th century. And it corresponds quite directly with the state um, 
rise in patient population, um, as you remember from the previous and the earlier slide I showed. Um, so what I want to say three conclusions about state hospital care from the, and, and this I mean roughly from the 1900s to the, um, to approximately the mid um, 1960s or so. Um, and I don't have time to go should, to make the, you know, to really um, um, underline and kind of give good proof for what I'm, my claims. But I, I think they're, I think, you know, more or less, I, I believe what I'm, I think it's fairly accurate to say that there are these three kind of myths that um, uh, have been the way in which we interpret care as state hospitals now, which I believe are not accurate. Um, so um, the first one is that state hospitals provided um, a, that um, that the belief that um, state hospitals um, were, um, they provided uh, um, humane care. I mean, <laughs> take that back. These aren't myths. These are the conclusions I want to make. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I do want to make three conclusions that I do, yeah, I, I, I think are um, fairly easily proven that state hospitals provided humane care um, for the most part, despite occasional, often horrendous abuses. These abuses often made it to the newspapers. But I've looked at you know, a lot of patient records over across not only California, but across the country um, in the from the both in the 19th and 20th centuries. And it's hard that care seems like, I mean, it, it seems fairly genuine and fairly not as um, abusive as one might imagine or as um, a, um, kind of in this not really warehousing as one might imagine as well. Um, lengths of stay were surprisingly short um, and admission into a state hospital certainly wasn't a life sentence as is, um, we often imagine. And then third, as I've been trying to make clear is that care and treatment remained um, remarkably holistic, focusing on both mind and body. Um, so this is just to give you just a really kind of quick rundown of average lengths of stay in California state hospitals this is just a little snippet, but it's true across the country too. Um, is, is see in 1941, the average length of stay was 7.3 months. Um, and then by 1951, the average length of stay had dropped to 4.5 months. This is largely also because the enormous amount of the state hospital budget in California had quadrupled between 1946 and 1956, largely you know, because of the post-war um, boom in California. But it's also true that the lengths of stays across the country um, diminished during this period of time and are consistent with the changes in California. Um, just to give you a sense of the expansive nature of care within state hospitals during this first half of the 20th century, and especially post-war era, is um, are a couple of quotations from early, from 1951, from the director of California Department of Mental Hygiene, who it set, it says in this I'm very um, kind of, um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I like to quote, because it is sort of, I mean, it's a little hyperbolic, but um, everything done to and for or around a mentally ill patient in a California hospital can be considered as therapy since therapy is the ultimate purpose of everything done. Um, and then just to um, kind of add the point that um, how they see treatment is that um, it's this holistic way of viewing the problem. And, and he writes, the necessity of applying knowledge to a total situation rather than breaking a problem up into small parts has long been recognized by modern science and psychiatry for many years, has been, and psychiatry for many years has been fighting the tendency to dissociate mind from body in the treatment of mental illness. Which, um, so, I now want to switch to um, you know, kind of give you the final and you know, the last part of the story, which is deinstitutionalization and the consequences of deinstitutionalization, or certainly the associated phenomenon that have occurred since deinstitutionalization. Um, 
And um, what um, I um, think it's worth emphasizing that um, yeah, you know, that I, while our you know that I, mental health um, our problems with mental health policy became ex exacerbated certainly with the institutionalization. It's still, I mean, I think there's a lot to learn. I'm still, you know, I think we need to think really hard about what we can learn about this history and especially the failure of the last fifty years and to try to understand you know how it can lead to more um, effective mental health policy moving forward. Um, so <laughs> there are a few myths of the, the institutionalization that are worth dispelling, um, that for you know, the first one is that deinstitutionalization was evidence-based, um, set of policies based on the proven efficacy, um, uh, of, uh, community care over the inferiority of state hospital care, um, that um, in truth, has never been proven in any in any sort of systematic way, certainly. And, and certainly, the impetus to start limiting state hospital populations had little to do with um, evidence-based practices. Um, then the second kind of myth has been the belief that since the introduction of Thorazine and other antipsychotic drugs, and um, Thorazine, just to really briefly in terms of its history is that it was, you know, it's the first effective psychotropic antipsychotic drug that was developed. It was synthesized in 1950 um, by in an attempt to create a um, centrally acting antihistamine. Turned out that it had these you know, unusual properties of causing um, calmness without over sedation like barbiturates tended to do. And also, as it turned out, actually helped um, diminish um, you know, a number of psychotic symptoms like auditory hallucinations. And um, so it, but it was um, introduced slowly beginning in the, it was um, Smith Klein French bought the um, French pharmaceutical rights to it in 1952 and then introduced it into the United States for a whole variety of um, indications, including psychiatric in 1954. But um, I think there's good evidence that the introduction of antipsychotic drugs is only secondarily kind of affecting the institutionalization, certainly not the, the major engine behind the um, decreasing population. Um, and um, then the um, Fifth, uh, the the final um, myth that is is that deinstitutionalization is motivated by humanitarian concerns about the inhumane treatment of state hospital care, and um, that as well is not um, well um, proven by the evidence. Um, and um, that um, it, interestingly, uh, that. Voluntary hospitalization, you know, people, you know, voluntarily seeking care in state hospitals actually increased quite dramatically during the 1950s and 1960s, suggesting certainly that people were not necessarily afraid of the stigma attached to um, care within the state hospital. Um, so the major, what I see is the major contributors to the rapid depopulation of state hospitals um, were in fact, um, at least you know, some of them included in the increasing um, fiscal crisis of state governments in the 1960s. And remember the Vietnam War, um, putting increasing pressure on both state and federal government. Um, also, um, you know, the most dramatic um, effect is was the passage, in fact, of the 1965 passage of Medicare and Medicaid, which allowed the transferring, especially of patients older than 65, from state hospital into nursing homes. And then um, the 1972 supplement, supplemental security income um, allowed younger uh, patients to be discharged and then to be able to um, live, for example, in board and care homes. Um, and then the, what put additional pressure on state budgets was the continued economic turmoil of the 1970s. 
This slide here just shows the decline in state hospital um, patients. And I, the only, probably the biggest reason why I'm showing it is just to show that while changes in um, commitment law did have some effect, um, it certainly didn't have the primary effect in resulting in the depopulation of state hospitals. And you can just see that LPS or the Lanterman Petra Short Act was implemented in 1969. And you can see that the decline um, it occurred um, certainly um, before um, LPS was um, passed. This slide I, um, illustrates almost simultaneously with the um, decline in patient population and the decreasing number of people being admitted in the state hospitals um, was a observation that increasing numbers of individuals with serious mental illness were being um, arrested and jailed. Um, and this is a 1972 article from California, in fact, where in one of the first articles on noting criminalization of serious mental illness. Um, this here is a really, I'm embarrassed to even show this, but it's a really unscientific and, but a quick and dirty way of kind of looking at how mental illness and homelessness have been linked in popular press. And this is an example from the um, Los Angeles Times and just looking at you know, both the simultaneous occurrence of mental illness or a number of search terms equivalent to mental illness. I tried to make it sort of sensitive to the uh, era. Um, and then also of homelessness. And you can see that it's not mental illness and homelessness don't really appear in the LA Times until the end. There are a few articles in the 1970 to 1979 decade, and then they start occurring much more rapidly uh, with much you know, more higher frequency since the from the 1980s onward. Um, this slide. It shows, um, and this is, um, you all are familiar with this, I'm sure. So um, it doesn't require too much explanation, except this is the point in time homeless count. And it is pretty remarkable the um, rapidity with which homelessness has risen, um, even, especially even over the last decade, um, just despite efforts to the contrary. Um, and this is, um, you, this is from 2022, um, and what you can see is it, it, just the point of this particular slide is just showing the relationship between unsheltered and sheltered homeless individuals, um, and how in and this is the contrast in New York, in fact, which has most it's a much larger shelter system, or many fewer unsheltered homeless individuals, but um, Los Angeles has, you know, as we all know, a huge number of unsheltered homeless individuals. Um, and then if you look at, it's really hard to um, get a sense of you know, the um, prevalence of um, serious mental illness in those who are homeless. This is, and, and I'm, this is um, from the point in time count as well from 2022. And it gives a, a estimate of 25%. And I don't know if how much we, you know, one would want to um, count on that as being particularly um, accurate or not. Um, I think it'd be higher or lower. Um, this slide here is shows it 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 it's kind of shows the relationship between. And I, I don't want to make too much of the causal argument in this because I think there's a lot more going on. But just what it does show, though, is um, as you can see that this line, um, you, you can see that incarceration rates in, um, are you know, rapidly increasing from the 70s to the to 2000 here, and um, and then you can see. Um, the um, you know, rapid depopulation of state hospital patients on this line here. Um, here's a photo, of, um, oops, sorry about that. This way is just a photo of Twin Towers. 
how am I doing time wise um, by the way to, sorry about that I'm, uh, I'm doing fine I think unless someone you have 13 minutes so it's oh good to... so okay so I I won't panic then um thanks <laughs> I'm using, uh, this is um just a photo of twin towers that um um and um I have I actually went a number of times with Philippe and I had been going to Twin Towers early on when Philippe um, first came here. And I just found it so disheartening and so depressing. And I feel bad that I couldn't sustain it. You know, Philippe has continued to do his ethnographic work in Twin Towers. It was just too kind of emotionally draining for me. And I, it was, I'd never seen so much kind of despair and, you know, and individuals with you know, psychotic behaviors that um, I'd never seen um, in you know, people, you know, smearing feces, catatonic behavior. Um, and um, it was just, it was really hard. Um, but Philippe has continued to really great work in the jail. Um, and um, this is just, um, you know, some more pictures. Um, this is slide um, charts the, um, Average day, daily jail census from 2009 to 2018. And you can see that the proportion of inmates, which is in here with serious mental illness, has increased over time, both absolutely and in, um, and in proportion to the um, non seriously mentally ill inmates, um, even with the de you know, decreasing um, inpatient. Um, jail population um so going going to mental health policy then i mean we if we just taking an overview look at mental health policies since the 1970s they've all tried to address in one way and been the major thrust has been both the ever-growing problem of homelessness and incarceration for those with um, serious mental illness those policies include AB 3777 from, and that was a um, pilot program um, from 1990 to 1993. And then there was um, AB 34 and AB 2034, which were the precursors to the Mental Health Services Act and helped build the basis for the Mental Health Services Act that was passed in 2004. Um, and then there's also and in the mental health services act just to, as a, a small aside is that the rationale behind it um especially around the construction of ab 2034 and 34 was the belief that by intensive treatment in full service partnerships which are essentially um modified act or assertive community treatment programs that if you gave people intensive treatment that you would be able to prevent and um, uh, both homelessness and incarceration and they came up with quite optimistic kind of numbers of um, how much savings would be um, accrued if um, the mental health services act was indeed implemented um, as you've seen in the previous slides though that despite the mental health services act incarceration and homelessness have increased and in, 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 um, continue to increase um, and um, I, I think um, even Care Court, again, with um, it's interesting, we'll have to see what happens with Care Court, but um, I think it's fair to say that um, at least so far that taken as a whole, none of um, California's mental health policies have been able to um, do what their authors had hoped. Um, to, I think, to understand the reasons for this, um, they're complicated, obviously, but um, I do think that um, many, um, you know, that we need to look at the larger context and changes in American political economy and culture that have maybe made it harder um, for mental health policy to address the um, real problems that it's failed to address so far. Um, and the changes, at least broad scale changes in American um, political culture and political economy. Um, just to summarize, and, and this is a really simplistic summary, but um, 
the changes that I think are the most significant include increasing uh, deregulation and privatization, which is also included within the mental health sector, um, draconian cuts in non-defense um, budgets, I mean, especially um, you know, social security cut um, and, and the um, social safety net, um, and um, increasing wealth and income inequality um, that has accompanied these changes. Um, the ideologic justification for um, this contraction of you know, what the welfare state as it was is, you know, I, I think provides a larger context for um, a mental health policy. Um, and to use a term that often has lots of meanings, but I, just as a summary, I mean, um, using the term neoliberalism is a it, it you know is a view that um, the government rests on a uh, upon a faith in market forces or righting social wrongs. And, and that has been the ideology that has driven many of the kind of larger political and economic changes over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and it's you know, rooted in the belief that competition and the free market um, will be effective um, at righting sort of the, um, the problems in society by organizing society. And, um, you know, and, and probably the most famous uh, is of uh, the neoliberal position has been Ronald Reagan, who um, argued for the contraction of government services, the deregulation and privatization of goods and services. Um, and it also um, it underpins a certain view of citizenship that, um, um, you know, view that does re resonate quite strongly with contemporary beliefs about the purpose of mental health treatment. It provides, in, at least in part, a justification for, you know, unfettered market capitalism and supply side economics and reinforces and re kind of formulates citizenship as individual responsibility, rationality, self-improvement, and individual empowerment. And those are, um, you know, also values that are you know, um, in you know, within kind of the recovery movement as well in, in a large in, within mental health um, care. So it, it's within this larger context and consistent with um, this what you know, um, neoliberal um, ideologies focus on the individual rather than the social, there has been this increasingly narrow vision of what counts as psychiatric disease in treatment. Um, the wild success of the pharmaceutical industry has helped um, reinforce a kind of more reductionist view of psychiatric illness um, and um, has, um, I think, you know, aided and abetted a, a form of biological reductionism. Along with this narrowing of psychiatric perspective, there has been an increasing separation between cure and care or cure, care and treatment that I think was um, that state hospitals at least had effectively bridged in some ways. Um, this is especially evident in the belief that mental health treatment can occur anywhere, such as on the streets or in jail, in prison. Um, in other words, mental health policy often is based on the belief that treatment can be separated from the social, psychological, and material context of where treatment actually takes place. Whether we're thinking about care court or you know, outpatient assisted treatment or the core interventions of the Mental Health Services Act, it seems to me that these policies are um, focused largely on the on individual intensive treatment and that they see the, the fundamental problem of those with serious mental illness um, is that they simply need to receive a properly, you know, a, um, proper narrowly defined treatment rather, um, you know, and so whether it's involuntary, um, you know, or not, and that that the rest will follow from intensive proper treatment, um, while not being taking responsibility for the much larger kind of social context in which people are living and um, with serious mental illness. 
Um, and that is something that I do think um, we can learn some about um, and from the past, especially from um, the, um, the ways in which at least care was envisioned and treatment was envisioned in a much more holistic, um, broader um, sense within state hospital therapeutics. Um, I'm going to conclude with this um, quote here. Sorry, I skipped this guy there. Um, with this quotation from Gerald Grob, and he writes, history teaches us that there is a price for implementing ideology ungrounded in empirical reality and for making exaggerated and rhetorical claims. Um, and I think that it, especially over the last 50 years and a, to, um, those with serious mental illness have suffered from a, at least an ideological commitment to a particular place of where treatment is provided rather than thinking about what the purpose of mental health treatment should be. Um, and so I, I, I think um, we can learn something. I mean, every generation of psychiatrists, it seems to me, if you look historically, has this um, a particular dislike for the past in believing that each new generation is smarter and more humane and possesses better interventions than our predecessors. Um, and I think occasionally this conceit is correct, but if history has anything to teach us, um, I, I think at least this history suggests that the asylum and state hospitals deserve a second look, perhaps the holistic view state hospital physicians took in their care and treatment of those suffering from severe mental illness may help us reconceptualize our current beliefs about psychiatric illness, treatment, and care. Um, and so hopefully um, for those especially you know, languishing on, you know, in our jails or on the streets, this um, history is something that we can learn from and um, improve the care of those with serious mental illness. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jill. So um, we have, um, uh, uh, there's, um, um, well, people are thanking you for your insightful presentation. Um, and um, there's a question about the, um, uh, about um with okay thank you for for, for Can I end now? Is yeah. slide check? okay wait uh, for, from, okay got it uh, from walter dunn um, hey, walter. um uh, here you can answer you can you can you can ask live uh, walter if you're there still otherwise i i'll cite it for you it's um uh, the um uh with respect to um uh whole person care and um, how do we reconcile the recent trend of deintegrating psychiatric hospitals from main hospitals? Uh, and, uh, you know, that's specifically with respect to physically relocating psychiatric hospitals away from um, the main, you know, the, where, where the resources and expertise of other medical colleagues are located. Um, it, and then, um, let's see, there's something also from Lincoln Bone. Um, um, uh, he wanted to know if you'd seen um, uh, Margot Cushell's article uh, at UCSF uh, um, uh, uh, that care court will not be a silver bullet for the issues that you've raised. And you did address uh, care court, which has received so much uh, optimistic press uh, so far. Um, and um, I also just wanted to use my chair's prerogative as as a as in the one, oh, well, we don't have any more time. So can you answer if you can, you can answer, but people will have to probably be leaving soon, but I, or, um, I, or we'll get thrown out probably. Okay. Walter, your question is really good question. Are, are you thinking of like, how it, psychiatric and moving psychiatric institutions away from the medical um, um, care. I mean, so that you have freestanding psychiatric institutions that aren't within, you know, a larger kind of system of care. It is interesting. I mean, it only made me think, I mean, there is something I, I, you could imagine. I mean, state hospitals certainly had, you know, they had, you know, both, you know, major medical units within the state hospital. And, um, 
it always made sense. I mean, I don't know if this is answering your question or not, but co I mean, I, I, just in terms of looking at the debate about, you know, whether or not to co-locate, you know, medical care within um, mental health clinics, especially, and that was an issue within um, the Department of Mental Health in Ollie County. And it always made more sense to me, at least, to co-locate an internist and internal medicine within uh, mental health clinics rather than kind of fragmenting people's care. Um, so I, I haven't, and then going to the second question on um, care court, I want, I'm trying to stay as kind of neutral. <laughs> I mean, I know this is, I, I mean, I, I'm really curious about care court and a number of us are. I, um, we, I, I kind of, I haven't seen the art. It was Mar who's the um, article by Margo uh, Kushel K U S H E L. She she was a colleague of mine at at um, um, I at yeah UCSF. I mean UCSF. I mean we didn't I, I think you know both care court I mean it it seems to me it's sort of in part and although people disagree it does seem like AOT on steroids in some ways. Um, I'm concerned, I mean, I think what concerns me also is the shift away from uh, having the departments of mental health responsible for people with serious mental illness and shifting it to the criminal justice system in some way. So it seems like not only does it increase fragmentation, but it also is giving, you know, treatment responsibility in some sense to the court system. Um, it also seems like that it's predicated on this belief, at least in part, is that the reason why mental health has, you know, we failed in our public mental health system is because the departments of mental health have been unable to really, or for whatever reasons, have been not doing their job in caring for people with serious mental illness. And I really think that's not the case. I mean, I think, you know, it's not that, it, because in large part, it's making the courts holding the departments of mental health accountable. And in fact, it's not that they don't want to be accountable ever. I mean, it's really uh, the resources available to the departments of mental health being able to provide a whole array of treatment, um, you know, both all the way from, you know, um, uh, supportive housing to, um, you know, um, you know, less in, in intensive treatments. But I think it, uh, then I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that it really, what has constituted the failure in our mental health policy isn't because of the lack of responsibility by the departments of mental health. I think it's really a lot more complicated than that. Well, thank you very much, Joel, and thank you, audience, uh, for for attending, and so many of you for having stayed over the time. And I, we will close now. And um, do let us know when your book comes out so we can get it. Yeah, yeah I'll give another talk. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thanks.